Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on molecular dynamics in Dialog APL. Um, so what I'm going to be doing today really is giving a brief sort of surface introduction to molecular dynamics simulations um, and one particular simulation that's quite simple that we can walk through and then along the way picking out a couple of key areas, um, examples and snippets of APL uh, which I, help, I hope will sort of showcase um, the ways APL could be useful for teaching molecular dynamics because APL is a mathematical notation and so translating formulae into uh, a computer program is relatively straightforward if you know APL. Um, and also if you're developing molecular dynamics, maybe a couple of the things uh, that we come across um, might be useful to, to someone like that. Um, so well, let's get into it. What is molecular dynamics? It's modeling small sort of systems uh, of like hundreds or thousands of atoms. It's used in material science. Um, and also, I guess there are, there are codes for simulating biological molecules. That's maybe some of the largest or more, most complicated systems you'll see in molecular dynamics. Um, and it's basically for these many body systems uh, solving Newton's equation of motion, which I have the vector form uh, here, F equals MA. Um, and one other thing before I talk about how we do that is the second equation is just in one dimension. Um, if you have a particle, the force acting on that particle due to another particle a distance x away is related to the derivative of the potential function v, um, where v is a function of x in our case. Uh, there are some more complicated potentials that might depend on velocity, but in ours, the forces only depend on the temperature. Uh, the forces only depend on the positions, sorry, the relative positions. Um, so these systems will have, uh, will be described by differential equations that are fairly complex and because of uh, them being many body systems, they're not analytically solvable. So you need to use numerical integrators, these numerical approximations um, to simulate the system through discrete time steps. And the system we're going to be um, focusing on today is the Velos velocity verlet scheme. Um, it's a very popular numerical integrator used in molecular dynamics, but also in other physics simulations for graphics programs and video games, for example. There are lots of MD codes out there, um, some quite large ones that are used for very large scale uh, simulations. Uh, LAMPS, for example, is written in C++ uh, and scales up to hundreds or thousands of cores. Um, so they're, well, they're open source and they're accessible but in a way, they're quite unwieldy if you want to um, make additions. Uh, and hopefully, showing this APL example, you might be able to see how um, scrapping together a quick demonstration or a, a simple simulation might be quite, uh, quite straightforward. Um, and modifying it can be relatively easy. And also the performance of the APL isn't so horrible that you wouldn't even bother with it. Um, so firstly, talking about APL for teaching molecular dynamics, I'm going to show you a Jupyter notebook which I prepared earlier explaining this simple physical system we're going to be simulating. And then later, towards the end of the webinar, I'm going to show you a web-based graphical interface uh, for showing the particles and playing with some of the parameters to see how that affects the simulation. So um, there's a link in the description below uh, to, to, the Job, uh, to the Jupyter Notebook I'm going to be showing you. And the um, system we're going to be focusing on is known as the Leonard Jones fluid. So this is like a monatomic gas, for example. So it's all the same types of atoms. And it's quite a simple equation describing the interatomic potential. So the potential energy of a particle due to a particle of distance r away is described by this equation here. Um, 
We're going to be using reduced units, so epsilon and sigma here are set to one, and you can see that the equation translates uh, quite straightforwardly into APL. Um, and here is the force derived from that potential in spherical polar coordinates. But now I'm going to jump to the Jupyter Notebook um, and give you a little bit of context for what we're doing here. Um, this example is basically taken straight from this blog post from Jacob Martin, where he gives the same example in Python. Um, and I'm going to compare the performance later as well. So there's a link there if you want to check that out as well. So first of all, we're going to be using sharp plot um, to plot that potential function. Uh, here it is in the notebook. That's the whole equation for the function. Everything else is just setting up the graphing. And here you can see the plot basically um, describes at how at close distances um, yeah, at, at close distances, the uh, particles will feel a strong repulsive force, but when they get a little distance away, there's a, there's a small attractive force between the particles, and that's what this describes. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit more context first, and then, and then come back to um, the shifted plot, which is, which is shown here uh, as well. So the first thing to uh, explain a bit more is this reduced units. So we set the mass of the particles, um, the constant parameters of the potential and the Boltzmann constant from thermodynamics. We set those all equal to one. And this has two real benefits. Firstly, you can um, simulate a general behavior which applies to all monatomic gases. And you could just plug in the numbers for a particular system afterwards uh, to get your um, macroscopic things like temperature and pressure or whatever else you want to calculate, get those out afterwards. And secondly, we can keep our numbers, well, yeah, keep the numbers that we calculate with close to one, or the order of one, uh, and then by doing that, reduce our floating point errors so we can keep the maximum precision possible. I'll come back to some more of these things, but first, um, last, you know, a bit of context I think you need is just how the velocity Verlet scheme works. So this is uh, very slightly modified from what you'll find on the Wikipedia page for the Verlet integrator. And basically it's just saying, okay, we've got this state with the positions of all the particles and all the velocities, and we've got the state at time t, and we're going to run it through these equations and end up with the state after time, after a time step delta t. Um, the only change I've made from, from the Wikipedia description is this step 2.5. We're using a thermostat because while the velocity integrator itself for a closed system will conserve the total energy, the systems which are done or used experimentally um, might use a heat bath to maintain a constant temperature or some other ways of maintaining constant temperature and pressure. Um, so for this example, we're using a thermostat to simulate maintaining constant temperature. Um, actually, I'll quickly show you that equation because it's very small, but the thermostat we're using is the simplest one there is. It's just rescaling the velocities at every time step because um, the temperature could, can be described um, as a function of the velocities for these small systems. Um, so every time step, we just multiply the temperature by some factor, which is the square root of our target temperature divided by the current temperature. Um, later, I'll show a modification to that. And lastly, in APL, I've implemented the Verlet, um, Verlet integrator as an APL operator, where the left operand function is the um, function that computes the pairwise forces, so or the force on a particle due to its uh, neighbors. And this means that even though we're using this quite simple equation for this simulation, if you had a more complicated uh, potential function, but it still relied on the positions only, you could just slot it into this operator and it would still work. So the first, um, specific piece of code I'd like to talk about is this uh, implementation of periodic boundary conditions. 
So periodic boundary conditions are uh, described here with this diagram that illustrated. Basically, we take in 2D, it's a square, or in 3D, a cube, this unit box, and that's our simulation space. And periodic boundary conditions is a bit like in Pac-Man and Snake or the Game of Life APL example. Uh, when a particle goes off of one edge um, of the simulation box, we basically wrap the positions around so it comes back through the other edge. And that's implemented really nicely in APL. I'll show you very quickly. So if I had a bounding box that's between naught and one, um, and my position in one dimension was 0.3 at one time, and then at the next time step it was 1.3, it's gone outside the bounding box, I can literally just use one mod to wrap the positions back round. And because APL is an array-based language, it takes no extra effort to uh, implement that wrapping uh, for many particles in however many dimensions. Well, we usually do up to three, but however many dimensions you want. Since for my simulation, we represent all of the positions as just a matrix. Um, I'll show you a bit more of that just now. So that's periodic boundary conditions. Um, then in the operator, we also apply the thermostat for rescaling. It's basically just an APL translation of these equations. And the next thing I'm going to show you is the forces computation itself. So to do that, I'm going to go into the uh, framework that I've set up um, in Dialog APL. Uh, I've dubbed it Apple Fizz, um, and I'll give you a GitHub link later. So Apple Fizz is just a folder full of text-based APL source files. So it's just APL functions written in plain text um, in a folder. And in the previous webinar, you were shown how to use link. I'm going to be using link here. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is change directory into here, just for my convenience. And secondly, I just copy the path to the, to the folder containing all those functions. And I'll use the user command uh, make this a bit bigger. Maybe that's too big. Yep, I'll just use the link user command bracket link dot create uh, apple fizz namespace and that folder. And now I've brought all of those functions into the workspace in the namespace apple fizz. So you can see all those functions and there's a couple of operators there. Um, and then the other thing I've done to implement this sort of framework I've, I've stolen from LAMPS, and that's these text-based script files for setting up the simulation parameters. Um, so this is this lives in the examples folder in the project, and I have a function run, and I'll run the Leonard Jones melt example. So control enter to step into that. The first few lines are just uh, some cleaning up the file name, which allows me to be lazy when I type. Then we're going to use uh, pick quad and get to bring the instructions in uh, as a nested vector of text vectors. Then we'll set up some uh, stuff to do with logging the outputting to text file, etc. I'm skipping over that for today. Then we use quad fx to fix this script in as a function called current script. And we'll keep the nested representation as a thing called source. And this last if statement here um, means that if I edit the script at any time while I'm running the simulation, I want those changes to be saved to the file at the end. Uh, that's what these, this last if statement does. So we can step into the script itself. It's all just plain APL. So we want periodic boundary conditions. I set my fixed temperature, everything's in these reduced Leonard Jones units uh, for convenience. We set some global variables up for the box dimensions for our periodic bounding box. And then to demonstrate some of the functionality or, or some of the ways it works, this, this code works, I'm just gonna start with a simulation of five atoms. And I've pre-prepared um, <coughs> a position matrix 
for the initial positions uh, so that I can get the behavior I want in a moment. Um, I could set different pair styles using this function. Um, in a moment, I'm going to show you an optimized version of the force function, but for now, it's just the plain one, just as it is in the Jupyter Notebook. We can set our thermostat, and run style is basically just a way of naming any given um, integrate uh, numeric integrator as, a, as an APL operator. Then some stuff about outputting to text files, <clears throat> and now we're going to simulate the system. So the setup gives us our positions and velocities. I've set the positions um, myself, and the velocities are just random floating points between 0 and 1. Well, that's a lie because uh, I adjusted them, but you can see that in the code yourself. But to compute the initial forces, which just depend on those initial positions, we're using this LJ cut function, which you can also follow through on the Jupyter notebook near the top, uh, which is based on these equations here. So, so the forces on any given particle uh, only depend on the distance to all the other particles. So the first thing we have to do is calculate the relative displacements of all the particles. And we do this by first uh, splitting the position matrix into a nested vector and then doing the minus outer product uh, on that. So now we end up with this matrix, which basically just gives you the relative displacement of a particle i to, um, from particle j and obviously the displacement uh, from particle j to particle i is just the same numbers but with a minus sign. Um, next comes the second part of the implementation of periodic boundary conditions. So not only do we want to wrap the positions around, but also we want to say that if two particles are um, more than half of the bounding box distance apart, we're going to uh, add or subtract one from the, from the distance so that it seems as though those particles are actually next to each other in the whole scheme. Uh, and that's what this line does. Then we just scale to whatever dimensions we set up. Um, so initially I had a bounding box of 0 to 1 so that I can use uh, a Boolean uh, to determine whether I want periodic boundary conditions or not. But then I need to scale up to my bounding box I've set to get the physical properties out. Um, next comes a bit where I'm going to have to explain the shifted potential graph again. Well, I say again for the first time. Um, so you might be sort of figuring out that if the forces depend on the distances between pairs of particles, that's going to get really computationally expensive and really memory intensive if we have lots of particles. Uh, and one way to mitigate that is to have a cutoff distance where we say, if two particles are more than a certain distance apart, well, the potential energy is basically zero or within error. So we're just going to not calculate the forces in those cases. The problem with this is that if two particles are separated and then they come within the um, cutoff distance, then there's going to be a sudden jump in potential energy, which isn't physical. So what we do is we shift the potential up, which basically brings infinity forwards um, and allows a smooth transition for those particles. Um, so to implement that, we just make a Boolean mask <clears throat> where a one indicates if two particles are within the cutoff distance. And then we use uh, dyadic transpose to remove or to set the leading diagonal to zero because particles don't interact with themselves. Then we um, use where to find these two dimensional indices of the ones in the R mask. And this basically is telling us um, that particle one has neighbors two and three, particle two has nearest neighbors one and three, particle three is one and two, and particles four and five are nearest neighbors with each other, which is represented in the, in the Boolean matrix. 
Then it's just calculating the forces, which is the translation of those formulae, uh, and some macroscopic properties, the potential energy, and something called the virial, which is used to compute the pressure. And then comes a kind of neat use of key. So we only calculate d phi, um, which is this force, sort of uh, derivative of the potential, for particles which have nearest neighbours. But one particle might have three nearest neighbours and another might have two or five. And so we need a way of summing up um, the forces on a particle due to its nearest neighbours. So if one particle has three nearest neighbours, the force acting on that particle is the sum of forces due to those nearest neighbours. So we're going to take the first, um, the first element of each of each of the vectors in calcpos, and use that to group um, the forces that we calculate, which only relate to calcpos, and we'll group it using the key operator. So what we end up with is. Uh, this statement, which, yeah, it groups it groups the forces on a particle due to its individual neighbors, and then you just need to sum those up, which is literally just the plus reduction of those. And now we the shape of this statement is the number of particles which have nearest neighbors. If no, if a particle has no nearest neighbors, it won't show up in this calculation. So what we initially do is create a matrix of zeros because if it doesn't have nearest neighbors, there's no force acting on it. And then we'll use um, index assignment to assign the correct forces to the correct particles. The numbers here are ridiculous because the positions I've set up, some of them are very, very close to each other. Some of the particles are very close to one another. So that's um, how we calculate the forces and there's you know, uh, a certain speed up to be made by only calculating some of the forces. Um, but, well, let's, uh, yeah, let's see how fast that is. So we can use the runtime command, examples slash LJ melt. Uh, it's a very small sample. I want to compare it to the Python sample, and there um, they simulate 32 atoms. So I'm going to go into the text file quickly, get rid of my pre-set up um, positions, and just set the simulation to have 32 atoms, and then uh, run the simulation again. So the Python example, I've got a notebook here I haven't put it on the GitHub yet, but it's literally just the code from um, from Jacob Martin's Python example. It's the code from here, slightly modified um, and put into a Python Jupyter notebook. And when I use the time it, uh, use Python's time it to, to figure out how long it takes, it seemed to take about 30 seconds. The APL example I have shown you here takes under seven seconds, but we can make it faster. So I have um, an optimized version of the force calculation. That's where the majority of the computation is spent. Uh, and I'll show you the modifications there that, that make a significant speed up. So uh, yeah. we'll run the same script again. So everything else is the same, but now we're using um, LJ cut opt, which I'll show you right now. A couple of modifications. Firstly, um, in calculating the distances. So initially we were doing an outer product selfie uh, on a lot of particles which creates this large nested vector. The table operator here uses the rank operator um, to pair up vectors in pos, 
because there's a selfie here, so pos is on the left and right. Vectors of pos are paired up with all the vectors in all the sub maximum rank subarrays of pos on the other side. So essentially, it's the same as an outer product, but it works on um, but it works on flat arrays. So where the outer product produced this 32 by 32 matrix, uh, the table operator produces a flat rank three array. Um, there are very few modifications otherwise. Um, I've also added an optimization where I'm going to get rid of the top right hand triangle of particle positions because the force on a particle i due to particle j, thanks to Newton's third law, is just minus the force on j due to i. Uh, the second optimization here is instead of using 2D uh, indices for calc pos, uh, we ravel the, the Boolean mask and just get a flat vector of um, a flat vector of indices to be used by key later. So, uh, because we've flattened out those indices, we have to compress the distance matrix matrices first two axes using um, this comma with square bracket in the, uh, axis specification. The rest of the um, Calculation is exactly the same. Uh, and then lastly, we'll use squad uh, on the compressed axis S. So S is this um, S is this rank three vector and we can compress the first two axes to get one long vector that we can use our flat vector of indices. Um, use the flat vector of indices to select uh, particular vectors in the matrix. Right, next is key, which works exactly the same, except we've flattened, we're not using the 2D IDs. Um, and we put the accelerations in as before. And that's literally all the modification it is. And we can see, is it the exact same? 32 atoms, yep. And we can see the, um, we can see the, the result here. So where before it took under seven seconds, now it takes under 700 milliseconds. Um, so yeah, you might be amused by that speed up. It's not bad. It's not for this for for quite a small system. Um, I was playing around and it didn't even seem you know it seemed to be maybe a few handful or a handful or two times slower than um, than lamps running the same code. But I don't know how well it scales yet. I'm going to investigate that in the future. The last thing uh, I said I'd show is um, the graphical interface. So I'm going to get another uh, session up and load the my server workspace because I've used my server to create this graphical interface and dubbed it my fizz. So we can copy that file path and just start the server. And that's now running on my computer. It's not much to it at the moment, but you'll see what, what's there. Um, it's literally a box here which will have all the particle positions represented and an Apple Fizz script much like before. So we can run the script and it scales up uh, my box. I can make my box different sizes if I want to. Um, and change how many atoms I want to see. Um, I have to have a maximum number of atoms for a couple of reasons. but. I think I allow up to 30 or 40, well, 32 at least. Yeah, yeah. So now we we're just sending callbacks to the server. 
and we can see this nice animation. It's pretty. It's kind of fun to watch. Um, yeah, look at them go. So there are some issues with the way it's implemented in terms of speed, um, especially related to the fact that I'm using uh, Ajax callbacks um, all the time, and so if it's a large number of particles, those callbacks take a long time, and then it and then it chugs. Um, but for a really tiny thing like this, it's, it's kind of neat. Uh, let's say we have 15, but all uh, atoms, I can also show, you know, um, also, uh, sorry, I also want to demonstrate uh, one quick thing where I, where I modify the script and you can sort of really see the results. So up till now, we've been using the simplest thermostat, which is the temperature rescale thermostat here. It's just this in APL. Um, where omega is the previous velocities and alpha is the current temperature and fixed temp has to be a global in this case. But uh, one very slight improvement um, by Berenson basically instead of at every time step scaling all the velocities down straight away, well you do still scale all the velocities but um, by adding this coupling constant tau you can have an exponential decay towards the um, target temperature. So I'm going to show myself writing that in right now. Um, someone could let me know how the font size is because I suspect it's too small to be any good, but I'm going to try anyway. So I know that my thermostats work by taking the temperature on the left um, and the velocity on the right. So we're going to multiply our right argument by lambda. So it's the square root. Uh, let me move this a bit. It's the square root of one plus delta t divided by tau. And I must remember to make sure tau is set in the script. The coupling constant there, uh, not ideal times minus one plus uh, our desired temperature divided by the current temperature. And that's all that's needed to implement this different thermostat. So I can run that script. If I start it, I might have done it wrong. Oh yeah, because I didn't comment that out. Uh, apologies, what I'm gonna do, just to make sure it works, is restart the server. So I'll copy all this, close the page. And make sure to comment out my description. There we go. That worked. Um, so it's quite hard to see from here. It's already scaled down to the temperature. But if I change the dump frequency, which is how often the um, or how many steps before the page updates the positions, then you'll be able to see it a bit better. So, and uh, one other way to make it more clear is after I create the atoms, which also creates random velocities, I can just multiply the velocities. So it, the initial temperature is much higher. And now you can see, apart from particles going all over the place, that kind of <laughs> exponential decay down to the target temperature. Um, I guess it's just quickly worth showing. Uh, this is the uh, my page for that uh, display right there. So we basically set up our controls. Um, well, the control panel is basically those buttons plus the text box for inputting the, the script. Uh, this is the default script. Um, and the one point of interest is every, so it's using a my server timer thing um, to send a callback every 50 milliseconds and no, it's not that easy to see actually but basically by making sure that my operator my verlet operator takes all the same, um, takes as arguments the same 
vector that it produces as a result, I can use the power operator to just run through a certain number of steps um, in one line and then just send back the result after that many steps. Uh, so I thought that was a pretty neat way of, of stepping through the simulation um, instead of using a for loop. And that's basically uh, all the bits of Apple Fizz I wanted to talk about today. Um, it's available uh, on GitHub. There's a link here. Um, I hope you enjoyed seeing the use of Jupyter Notebooks. If you want to know more about the details of the simulation, you can go ahead and, and read more on there. Um, the use of key for set, uh, assigning forces to particular atoms, the use of rank for speeding up by at least a factor of 10, uh, and the my server GUI, which just looks kind of neat. There's definitely a lot of improvements to be made. Um, in the future, I hope to attempt to use uh, isolates. Um, I think, I don't know if I mentioned it already, but LAMPS basically uses something called domain decomposition um, so that it can have parts of the simulation run on different processes and then just pass messages between the processes um, to, to scale up to much larger simulations. And I want to see uh, how far I could go with isolates in, in that direction. Um, I'd also like to implement a couple of more thermostats. Um, there's one other easily implementable one uh, by Anderson, which is also to do with modifying velocities directly. But there are other more complex ones that require a whole other numerical integrator to be uh, implemented, basically. You can't just plug it into the, to the same Verlet scheme in the same way. Um, also, more models. So at the minute, this is very limited. It's, it's one box with a monatomic gas in it, but there's potential to, uh, well, do all kinds of, of things really. And then also graphing, maybe live graphing the macroscopic, like a graph of the temperature on the, on the graphical interface, or at least a, a, a printout of the current temperature or the time averaged, which is um, what you'd be more likely to use in a real scenario. Um, so, I'll just see if there are any last questions, but otherwise, uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, I don't have the date for the next webinar, but there is one more before Dialogue 19 user meeting. All right, thank you very much.